Good morning. We're so happy to have you here for Lord's Morning, the Sunday morning. And today is another combined service. Uh, this is the scheduled one, however. Last week was a special event. Uh, but we want to welcome our youth group here as we have our combined service for this first Sunday of the month. Now, as we get ready for today's worship, I invite you to open up your Bibles for our call to worship. If you have your Bibles with you, please open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 32. If not, we have it, on, of course, on the screen. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7, and starting in verse 1, it says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters... They shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Let's pray. Dear Father, we pray today that we would see this psalm and that we would see our need for salvation utterly. And Lord, we pray that our worship to you would be a worship pleasing to you, not Worship offered by the hands of flesh, but by the gratitude and salvation of spirit. Father, we pray for our sanctification that we will, as this passage says, learn to hate our sin, to hate the things that separate us from you, and learn to love that though we may not be able to enjoy the pleasures of sin, in exchange we gain a thing far greater, a holiness and shouts of deliverance. Father, we pray our worship is acceptable to you this morning. And we pray that as Pastor Eric uh, speaks, that you will open our hearts to receive your word and help us this day to draw closer to you. Father, we pray these things and we ask them in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Well, in response to this very special call to worship, let's go ahead and stand up, if you please and praise and song together. Good grace.
going wide Are you heavens? Let the praise go up as the walls come down All creation, everything with breath Repeat the sound All his children, clean hands, pure hearts Good grace, good God, his name is Jesus Wide, swing wide, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down, all creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound, all his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God, his name is Jesus. Once again, good morning and welcome back to our combined Sunday service. Just a reminder that this is the first Sunday, there's, so we're going to do the Lord's Supper after the sermon. Uh, so if you need to, just go ahead and prepare the bread and the juice uh, to get that ready so that you know once the sermon's over, we can go straight into that. So today we continue on our, our series on the book of Romans. And today we are continuing on about why we need the gospel. Remember, the book of Romans is about the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And Paul is very systematic. He's very logical in his thinking. And he begins by sharing about why we need the gospel. And of course, that is because we are sinful. All of us are sinful. And that is why Christ came to die on the cross for us. And that's the good news. I mean, believe in him. Holy Spirit dwells in you. And you have the power of God to overcome and to be sanctified, to become more and more like Jesus. And today we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. And I've titled it, God the Impartial Judge. God the Impartial Judge. Because He is impartial. He judges us accordingly. All of us. He is the fair judge. So when I was 16 years old, all the way up to when I was 16 year, years old, I was a non-Christian. So I was from, uh, 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 div- uh, my parents were divorced. I, I had a tough time, I would say, uh, from the f- uh, growing up uh, without my dad around and you know, having a lot of anger and hatred inside of me. And, uh, and as I became a teenager, I, I began to live life on my own terms. I would do whatever I wanted to. I would... Uh, sin however I wanted it to and I I ended up hurting a a lot of people I hurt my mom I hurt my dad hurt my younger brother and I of course I ended up hurting myself in the choices uh, and 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 living in this state of uh, sin and rebellion just wanting to be my own boss wanting to do whatever I could whatever I I wanted to do and and it was just uh, it was just this state of constant uh, rebellion I would say uh, I, I knew inside my heart, I knew that I hurt people, that I had, you know, sinned, I, I wasn't perfect, that I had done wrong, and deep down I knew I was a sinner. I felt guilty about some of the stuff that I did, but yet at the same time, I just continued to live life on my own terms. And then when I was 16 years old, a friend of mine by the name of Alvin invited me to church. He's like, hey, do you want to come to my church? We're having this uh, this." Uh, series of uh, evangelistic uh, plays called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Uh, that was the name of the play, uh, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. You know, we're having it all, all the weeknights for this week. Uh, would you like to come with me? It was a summer vacation. I was like, okay, church. Yeah, the word on the street is, the word on the street is that there's a lot of pretty girls in church. So yeah, why not? Yeah, I'll go check it out. You know, check it out for the, to see if there's any pretty girls in church. And uh, that's what I went. That's why I went. So I, I went with Elvin, I stepped into the church. It was my first time in church, and uh, at that point, it was five years. The last time I was in church was when I was 11 years old. Uh, so, and I stepped into the into church, and then and then the play came along. You know, it was a very very well made play by this uh, 
particular church, uh, there, you know, the, it ha- basically has scenes of people dying, and, and, and those who believed in Jesus would go to heaven, but those who didn't would uh, suffer for an eternity for their, as punishment for their, their own sins uh, in hell. And so that play kind of uh, shocked me into the fact that there was a hell waiting for people for, as punishment for those who d- choose not to believe in Jesus. But it also touched me by the truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins so that I can be with Him forever and ever in heaven. So that night I felt very convicted and I was shocked by the fact that there's a hell and touched by the fact that Christ died for me so that I can go into heaven. And I was shocked and touched into accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Because I knew that I was sinful. I knew I had done a lot of wrong things, so I was convicted of my sins. I, I was convicted of the, the fact and the truth that I needed Jesus in my life. And that night, I became a Christian. And after the play, uh, you know, uh, they said, hey, who wants to raise your hands and you know, accept Jesus into your life? And, and I did that. I raised my hand. I f- filled out the form. And then my friend uh, at the end brought me to see a, a counselor from the church and as the counselor was talking to me, and I just felt so convicted, you know, of the, the bad things I'd done. And I started to cry as a 16-year-old. You know, it's very embarrassing for a 16-year-old uh, boy to uh, start crying. But that's, that's what happened. I was just so convicted by, by my own sins as well as by the love of Christ uh, that, that he had for me. I was just crying and, and crying. And, um, and that night was the best night of my life because Jesus came into my life. And it started with the Holy Spirit convicting me of the fact that I was a sinner. And being convicted that you are a sinner is a cornerstone of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely essential for you to understand why Jesus died on the cross for you because you are a sinner and that he came to sta- save you. Uh, alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous um, for recovering alcoholics, they have this 12-step program. And the first step is always to admit that you are powerless over alcohol and your life has become unmanageable and that you need help. That's the first step for them, to come to the fact that you need help with your alcohol problem and you can't do it alone. And the first step in becoming a Christian and accepting the good news of Jesus is to accept the fact that you are a sinner and you can't, Make your own way to heaven. You can't do good, enough good works to get yourself into heaven. And you need Jesus. And that's where the good news of Jesus Christ comes in. And, and that is how Paul guides us through the gospel in the book of Romans. By first helping us to realize the truth that all of us are sinners. So let's take a look at the text today. It's found in Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. Verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are law to themselves, even though they did not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to be, understand, help us to understand what your word is saying. Help us to apply it into our lives and help us know the power of the good news of Jesus that we have that we can share with others around us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Paul starts off in verse 12 by saying that for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So Paul is saying that the Gentiles, you know, the non-Jews, they don't have the law. They don't have the Old Testament. The law back then was their Old Testament. That's the, but, they have, but they have sinned against God even apart from the law, even apart from the Old Testament, you don't, you don't have to know the Old Testament to know that you've sinned. Because Gentiles know that they have done wrong. Their conscience, their conscience condemns them. And Paul is saying that the Jews who have the law, who have the Old Testament, have also sinned against God because they knew the law, they had the law, but they did not obey the law. They did not obey 100% of the law 100% of the time. They couldn't be perfect. 
Now, it's very important for Paul to mention both Jews and Gentiles because a reminder that, number one, that's the truth. All men are sinful, all have sinned, everyone has sinned against God. And number two, the church that he was, speak, that he was writing to in Rome consisted of both Jews and Gentiles. It was, Rome is the most cosmopolitan city in the world at that time. It's got many people from many diverse, diverse backgrounds, diverse cultures, di- uh, diverse uh, racial backgrounds. And many of them had accepted Christ into their lives, regardless of their backgrounds. So now the church in Rome was full of Jews and, and non-Jews, uh, and full of uh, Ro- uh, Romans and barbarians and different people. So just as the church in modern-day modern day America is full of different people from different backgrounds, so the church of Rome was full of different people from different backgrounds. And Paul ends this message, this passage, by reminding us in verse 16 that on that day, I think I have this slide, yes. On that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of man by Christ Jesus. So Paul is reminding his hearers that at the end of the age, Jesus will be God's agent of judgment and both people's actions and their secret hidden thoughts will be revealed. Nothing will be kept secret. Everyone will be found to have been wanting. Everyone will be found to have been sinners. So God is impartial as a judge. He will deal with people according to the dispensation that they live in. Jews who have the law of God will be judged by the law of God because they have not followed the law of God 100% of the time 100% 100% of the law. And, and Gentiles who are outside the law will be judged by their conscience because in their heart of hearts, they know that they are not perfect. Just as when I was 16 years old, I knew deep down that I had sinned. I hurt people. I hurt myself. And I was not perfect. They know they've sinned before. God is impartial. He will judge us according to where we are, according to our backgrounds, according to where we come from, where we are at that time. So Paul continues on in verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So the Jews in Paul's day, they had the Old Testament, they had the law. And uh, salvation, of course, came through the Jews. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, came from the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. Jesus' human lineage, he was a Jew. So the Jews boasted in the fact that they had the, the, law, the law. We're, you know, they're saying we're different from our pagan neighbors. We don't worship idols. We have uh, the, the law of God given to us by God himself through Moses and the prophets. Uh, we have been specially chosen by God himself. We are the chosen people. We have the law of God. But Paul makes it very, very clear that it was not having the law that makes one righteous. It was practicing the law, applying it into your life. That's why I always like to tell uh, the Bible study groups that I lead, don't just understand what the Word of God is saying to you, but apply it into your life. Paul makes it clear that hearing the law of God does not make you right with God. Doing the law of God and obeying His statutes is what makes one righteous before God. So famous Bible preacher and teacher Chuck Swindoll once gave this illustration. So I'm quoting him here. I'm speaking from his point of view. So Chuck once said, For a moment, let's pretend you work for me. In fact, you are my executive assistant in a company that is growing rapidly. I'm the owner and I'm interested in expanding overseas. To pull this off, I make plans to travel abroad and stay there until the new branch office gets established. I make all the arrangements to take my family and then move to Europe for six to eight months. And I leave you in charge of the busy... Uh, this busy organization in the United States. I tell you, I will write to you regularly. I'll give you direction and instructions. Of course, this is pre-Zoom, so he has to write. Uh, I leave you and you stay. Months pass. A flow of letters are mailed from Europe and received by you at the national headquarters. I spell out my expectations. Finally, I return. Soon after my arrival, I drive down to the office. I am stunned. Grass and weeds have grown up high. A few windows along the streets are broken. I walk into the receptionist's room and she's doing her nails, chewing gum and listening to her favorite rock station. I look around and those waste bags, uh, trash cans are overflowing. The carpet hasn't been vacuumed for weeks and nobody seems concerned that the owner has returned. I ask about your whereabouts and someone in a crowded lunch area points down the hall and says, I think he's down there. 
Disturbed, I move in that direction and bump into you as you are finishing a chess game with our sales manager. I ask you to step into my office, which has been temporarily turned into a television room for watching afternoon soap operas. And I said, what in the world is going on, man? And you reply, what do you mean, Chuck? Well, look at this place. Didn't you get any of my letters? Letters? Oh, yeah, sure. We got every one of them. As a matter of fact, Chuck, we had letter study every Friday night since you left. We have even divided all the personnel into small groups and discussed many of the things that you wrote to us about. Some of the things were really interesting. You'll be pleased to know that a few of us have actually committed to memory some of these sentences and paragraphs that you wrote. One or two memorized an entire letter or two. Great stuff, you know, you have in those letters. Great stuff. Now, if this sounds a little familiar, familiar, that's because Jesus, the Lord, gets to the bottom line when he said, in effect, uh, in effect, I left you an example of what you should do. Carry out my directions, fulfill my commands, follow my instructions. That's obedience. That's to doing what we are told to do. So it is not hearing the law that makes a person acceptable to God, but doing what it commands, obeying it. And unfortunately, nobody can obey 100% of the law 100% of the time. We have all sinned. We are not perfect. Paul says in verse 13 that God would declare righteous the person who did not just listen to the law, but did what it required. The law warned that anything short of perfect obedience to it made you guilty before God. D.L. Moody got it right when he said the Bible was not given for our information but for our transformation. The Bible was not given for our information but for our transformation. And no one, Jew or Gentile, have been able to keep 100% of God's law 100% of the time. It's simply not possible. We have all sinned. We have at one moment or another in our lives sinned against God. And that's why we need Jesus. Jesus who kept God's command perfectly and was found worthy to die on the cross for our sins. And even if people had the correct uh, outward action, how about their inward attitude? Uh, they might have been moral on the outside, but what about their heart? It is possible for a person to be guilty of uh, theft, adultery, uh, or even idolatry, even if no one saw them commit these sins outwardly because in the Sermon on the Mount, we are told that such sins can be committed in the heart. So we need to be clean, not just in our actions, but also in our hearts. In Romans chapter 2, verse 16, let me just go back to that verse, says, On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that there will come a day when God will reveal the secrets of our hearts by Christ Jesus, every evil, lustful, greedy, selfish, hateful thought will be revealed and we will all have been found to be guilty. Remember that Jesus said that it's not just our outward behavior that matters, but also our inward thoughts and attitude. And when our sinful thoughts and attitudes have been revealed by Christ, we will have found to be wanting we have found to be sinful. And that is why, also why without fail, all of us need Jesus. Jesus, whose thoughts and inner life and heart is always 100% right with God. He was found worthy to die for us, and in Him we have life. But God is fearing His judgment concerning His judgment on the Gentiles, on the non-Jews. This is what He says in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they did not have the law. They show that the, law, the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So the Gentiles do not have the law in the sense that God did not give it to them in the beginning. The Old Testament was given to the Israelites through Moses and the prophets. Therefore, God will not judge the Gentiles by the law. However, even though the Gentiles don't have the law, they don't have the Old Testament, they know that they should do things that are right and not do things that are wrong. Verse 15, let me repeat it. They show that the work 
of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. In other words, their conscience, their conscience both guides, both, both guides them and at times condemns them, whether or not they do right or do wrong. Inside all of us, we have this uh, intuitive perception of what is right and what is wrong. All people have this. We can refer to this uh, inner sense of right and wrong as our conscience. Wherever you go, you'll find people with an inner sense of right and wrong. And this inner judge is our conscience. You find among all cultures a sense of, of sin, a fear of judgment, and attempt to atone for sins. And in the ancient days, all these cultures would try to appease whatever gods they worship by offering sacrifices or doing some things, so doing some works to appease the gods, so gods, uh, so that they would not be punished. Uh, remember last week we talked about the Nuremberg trials where the Nazis were put on trial by the Allies for war crimes, for the Holocaust, the evil that was committed. And they said, oh, you can't blame us. We were just following orders, you know. Blame Hitler. He's, Hitler's dead, but he, it was his orders. But the judge and the prosecution said, no, you have a conscience. You Inside you, you, you should know that what you did was wrong, and yet you did it. And because of that, they were found to be guilty, just as we are found to be guilty because inside of us we have conscience, but despite that, we do what we want. We have sin. We are not perfect. I have not met a single person besides Jesus who can say to me, I am perfect. I have never once sinned. I have never once hurt anyone before. Instead, what I often hear from people is, I'm just human. I'm only human. No one's perfect. Don't, don't blame me. No one's perfect. I'm just a human being. That's what I often hear from people. I have never heard from somebody say, I am perfect. I've never done anything wrong. And this proves that we all have a conscience that makes us, marks us as guilty. So the law is written on our hearts. Our conscience confirms this. All people everywhere have this sense of right and wrong. So on this basis, God can judge people at the end of time. Uh, for example, we all know that it is wrong to murder and harm others because we all have a conscience. And God can hold us accountable. He has written His law on our hearts even if someone has never read the Bible before, there's a general agreement that certain things like murdering and stealing adultery and all that stuff is wrong. So there's an agreement on that. As C.S. Lewis uh, wrote in his book, famous book, Mere Christianity, and let me just read it to you. But the most remarkable thing is this. Whenever you find a man who says he does not believe in a real right and wrong, you will find the same man going back on this a moment later. He may break his promise to you, but if you try breaking one to him, he will be complaining it's not fair because you can, before you can say Jack Robinson. A nation may say treaties do not matter, but then next minute they spoil their case by saying that the particular treaty they want to break away from was an unfair one. But if treaties do not matter and there's no such thing as right and wrong, in other words, if there's no law of nature, what's the difference between a fair treaty and an unfair one? Have they not let the cat out of the bag, out of the bag and shown that whatever they say, they really know the law of nature just like anyone else? These then are the two points I wanted to make. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. Secondly, that they do not, do not, in fact, behave in that way. They know the law of nature. They break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. So C.S. Lewis called this the law of nature. He says that universally across the board, there's this law of nature. People try to live up to it, but people are unable to live up to it. Every person has some category of right and wrong. So it's very popular in, popular in our day today that uh, in our in today to say that there's no right and wrong. You know, it's postmodernism. It's it's up to you. It's it's all relative to your point of view. Uh, you may believe in something which I don't believe in, and that's okay. And I may believe in something which you don't believe in, and that's okay. So that's the postmodern uh, thinking or mindset that things are just relative. It, it, it's, it's everywhere. You, you see it even in Hollywood movies. 
Uh, these days, in the past 10 years, the plot twist is always that the good guy turns out to be the bad guy and the bad guy turns out to be a good guy. Or a guy who seems bad is actually not bad, he's good. A uh, guy who seems good turns out to be not so good. That's been the plot twist for the last 10, 15 years in Hollywood films and dramas because of an influence of postmodernism. But the truth is, the vast majority of people are not postmodern in their thinking. They are absolute, absolutists. They can, say that, they can say that you can believe in whatever you want until what you believe in affects what they believe in. Uh, one example is just talk about politics uh, with people in this country. Uh, many people will turn out to be very dogmatic about what they believe in, whether whichever party they believe in. Uh, they'll turn out to be very dogmatic and they will throw postmodernism out the window because your beliefs have affected their beliefs and they want to make sure that your beliefs do not affect their beliefs. So these days, everyone is at least trying to have some sense of right and wrong, some sort of moral code. Uh, very few are... Uh, so, sorry, let me go. Uh, so God is always speaking to us. He communicates to us through His creation as well as through our conscience. The problem is not that God has not revealed Himself to us, the problem is that we have rejected him despite his revelation. We have turned away from God in our rebellion against him. Every person you meet, there's an awareness of God, whether they like it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they know it or not. But every person you meet, including ourselves, are in rebellion against God. This is the result of human sin. This is the result of the fall. Therefore, Jesus Sorry, therefore, without Jesus, we would not be made right with God. So, before we end, I want to remind uh, all those of you who are viewing uh, this service, of, I want to remind you of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, it's true that no one is perfect, but in Christ, we have someone who has never ever once sinned. And Jesus was found worthy to die on the cross for our sins so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will be saved, will be with him forever in heaven. Whether Jew or Gentile, if you believe in Jesus, you are saved to be forever and ever with God in heaven. And this promise, this good news is given to anyone who believes, regardless of their race, their culture, or their background. And I want to end with this uh, interesting testimony which I encountered uh, recently. And uh, so this is a picture of a man by the name of Jack Barsky. That was actually not his original uh, name, but we'll get to that later. So before Jack Barsky was hauled in by the FBI for questioning in 1997, he had been living a double life. For 19 years, Barsky spied on America for the Soviet Union during the Cold War and after the breakup of, breakup of the Soviet Empire, he spied for, the, for Russia. His job was to infiltrate U.S. society and get close to security officials and pry information from them. He was, he's, known what a, he's known as a sleeper agent. And he was undete undetected until May 1997 when the fi FBI finally caught up with him. And he said that I came to terms with the fact that I did a lot of bad things. Uh, never mind breaking laws. I hurt people. I did bad things. Uh, bad things. I served a bad cause. So his original name, he was born as Al Albrecht Dietrich in uh, East Germany in 1949. In college, he studied chemistry. He proved to be brilliant. And the KJB, uh, KGB, sorry, uh, which was their secret police, uh, approached him and to work as a spy in America. He agreed because, you know, he felt it would be cool, he would be above the law, it would be an adventure. So in East Germany, Dietrich uh, learned the secret handwriting, Morse code, how to lose someone who was following you, all these, you know, James Bond type of stuff, I guess. And then he went to Moscow, he learned English, he mastered hundreds of English words every day. And then he was shipped off to uh, America, went off to America with uh, $6,000 in his bags, and instructions to assume the position of a businessman, get cozy with politicians and other influential people in Washington. An employee at the Soviet embassy uh, got him a birth certificate that would give him the basis to get a passport. Uh, basically, he had gone to this uh, grave, graveyard and he spotted this uh, to tombstone of a 10-year-old uh, who died in 1955 by the name of Jack Barsky. And so he, he mentioned that name to this, uh, the, the, the employee at the Soviet embassy and they managed to get him the birth certificate. 
And under his new name, Barsky first worked as a bicycle messenger in New York, a job that provided him with opportunity to get to know the city, observe people, and learn, to, and learn about the city. And the messenger job was actually really good for me, he said, because uh, it Americanized me and I was interacting with people who didn't care where I came from, what my history was, or where I was going. And he, and he said, I was able to observe and listen and become more familiar with American customs. So for the first two, three years, I had very few I had very few questions that I had to answer people. Later, he studied computer science and he worked as a programmer for MetLife Insurance. And if anybody asked him, why do you have such a strange accent? He said that, you know, my mother was German. And during the day, he was a good neighbor and an upstanding citizen. At night, he prepared profiles for the Soviets and of uh, potential agents and wrote assessments of uh, developing political military situations. And he would stuff them in these uh, steel containers and left them at uh, drop sites uh, around the city or in parks. And he was also living a double personal life because in East Germany, he had a wife and family. And in America, he also had another wife and family. Uh, so, you know, and he said, I did a good job of separating these two, uh, t these two lives. You know, in America, I'll be Barsky. And Barsky had nothing to do with uh, East Germany Dietrich, uh, which was his original name. And East Germany Dietrich had nothing to do with uh, the American Barsky. So he was living this double life. Uh, but the facade uh, eventually crumbled. Uh, eventually, the FBI caught up uh, with Barsky. And uh, for a weekend, the FBI arrested and interrogated him. Uh, and he bargained for clemency. And he came clean with everything. And ultimately, the FBI uh, validated his story and decided that he can, they can let him go. And they allowed him to use the name Barsky on his uh, now legalized documents. And a few years later, he came to know Jesus through workplace evangelism. That's why I like to remind those who are still in the workplace, still in the working in the offices, that workplace evangelism is very important. And those of you who are still studying evangelism in your schools is very important. And so this is what uh, Barsky says. So he says, I hired a new administrative assistant, and what impressed me most about this young lady was this incredible, peaceful glow on her face and a certainty about all things in life. And he asks her, how is it that you arrived at such a marvelous inner peace? And her answer was eye-opening, but at the same time, it was hard to believe. She said, I, I take my strength from Jesus. And he asks himself, how can one take strength from somebody whom one has never seen before? And uh, being a curious scientist, he, he wanted to find out more. So he opened up the Bible for the very first time. Uh, and uh, this is what he says, to continue what I consider a purely academic exploration, I opened up the Bible and I asked my assistant to take me to a church. And he said the service was beautiful and I was particularly moved by how many times the pastor uttered the word love during his sermon. That drew me in. I was hungry for real love. You have to understand, this, this is a man who grew up uh, in a society that had, was supposed to have no religion, came to America, he was working a double life, did what he wanted, and now he was hungry. He, he tasted this real love. He was hungry for real love that's found in Jesus. And, and he continues on. Interestingly, the pastor had the very same peaceful expression on his face that, had, uh, that I had observed in my assistant. Eventually, Barsky accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and the guilt was taken away. He knew that he had been forgiven in Christ, that Christ had taken his punishment upon himself, and the same peace came upon Barsky. Uh, you can find out more about his story by going to YouTube and just uh, checking him out, uh, Jack Barsky. It's uh, pretty interesting to uh, listen to. And uh, interesting enough, in his videos, you can tell that there's a peace about him, a peace, the, uh, the peace of Christ that came upon him. So in your workplaces, in your families, in your schools, it's very important to tell people about the good news of Jesus because people need to hear about what Jesus did for them. People need to come to know Jesus as Lord and Sa Savior because we are all sinful. We all need Jesus. Whatever their background, Jew or Gentile, no one is perfect. Everyone needs Jesus. So let's share the good news of Jesus with people. And now we come to the time of the Lord's Supper. And this is a time when we partake of the Lord's Supper together. So for those of you with uh, the cup and uh, the, the bread from church, uh, go ahead and uh, get this ready. Uh, for those of you 
who don't, uh, feel free to get some bread or crackers and, and get some juice uh, ready uh, for this uh, Lord's Supper. And uh, as we go into it, let's just remember why we partake of the Lord's Supper, why we remember what Christ did for us on the cross. Because as we said today in today's sermon, all of us, all of us have sinned. No one is perfect. We have all come short of the glory of God. But Christ, but Christ saved us. But Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died so that we can be saved. Pastor Jeff, do you need one? All right, you got one. Okay. So, so as we come together for the Lord's Supper, let's remember that. So uh, once again, the instructions, delicately peel off the first layer uh, to get the bread. And then later on, we'll peel off the second layer to get to the cup. So just get that bread ready. So let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And get that bread ready. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. And peel off the second layer for the cup. Let me continue in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us on that cross. We thank you that today we can partake as a church, even though we're physically distanced from each other, but we can partake together as a church and remember what you did for us, that your body was broken for us, that your blood was shed for us so that we can live. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we will have the closing response song. Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation to heaven and spoke your name into the night and then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ
Praise God for Pastor Eric's message to remind us that it's it's not a it's not a matter of knowing the law, but it's obedience. Uh, James one twenty two. It's one of my memory verses that we had to do when when I was teaching kids ministry way back when. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Um, really, really, really vivid picture of uh, Chuck Swindoll and. That story of, imagine if I was your boss and I come back from vacation and you say, oh, we read your letters. <laughs> it's not enough, is it? We have to be making sure that Scripture is meant to transform our lives so that we long to obey and thereby please God. Well, let's go ahead and go to our announcements as we finish our service for today. If this is your first time, uh, welcome. We're so happy to have you with us. Pastor Eric is here every week. He's our main congregation pastor for the English ministry. Uh, so if you'd like, we'd love to get to know you. We're inching forward uh, at the possibility of opening up to uh, indoor services, hopefully soon as vaccines get closer and closer. So we're hoping that for those of you who fill us out, we may be able to come meet you soon. Uh, if you use a QR code, or if you go on the screen, or if you go to our website at arcadiacbc.org and fill out our Connect form, uh, it would really help us to catch up and, and know how we can pray for you and catch up with you so that maybe one day soon we can get to, to see you. Uh, next announcement is uh, online giving. Uh, for those of you who are in the habit of, well, let's face it, most of us have gotten used to giving online, so this is nothing new, but... Occasionally, we need a reminder. My wife has been bugging me for the past couple of days in a row to do our online giving. And so uh, e even your pastors need the reminder uh, because it's not that visual of, hey, I'm in church, let's, let's remember our giving. But it's a, it's a discipline that we need to continue to cultivate. So online giving is available. You can use the QR code on the screen or, again, the link on the bottom. Next is our food drive. Now that I'm kind of excited about this, this is actually happening next Saturday. If you want to serve, youth included, uh, there's some spots available for service. Basically, it will be an opportunity for you to come here to church and to collect uh, food and clothing dropped off for uh, the needy in our community. It will be starting on February 13th. That's next weekend. Uh, at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And a little bit of information about this is that uh, you're going to be coming in through the West Driveway. That would be the driveway close to El Monte Boulevard or road or whatever it is. And then 
uh, the exit will be on the other driveway closer to the library. Uh, there, uh, all the food and all the donations should be put in the trunk. Uh, so you pull up to our contact list system, you open up your trunk, and then our volunteers will be able to take it out and drop it off um, with the organizations that we've partnered with. Now, as far as what to donate, there are some items on the list here, uh, various things such as food or hygiene items, uh, things that the homeless might need in specific. Uh, but we want to give a special attention to clothing. Uh, I know I'm guilty. A lot of times I go through the I go through the closet and I find, eh, I don't want to wear this anymore. I, this has been in my closet for 15 years, and that's been in a pile in the corner for another 12. And you gather them all up and you just throw them in a basket and you take them to the donation center. But we do ask that we have a little bit of dignity when we give these donations and that if the items that we give are, um, if they're moth-eaten uh, or raggedy, uh, let us have pride. We want to share the Christian love, not the uh, the feeling of, here, you take my unwanted things from me. This is a, a donation of, of pride and, and giving and love. And so if you have anything that's used, uh, please make sure that it is in good condition. Also make sure that anything that you, you donate, please wash first. Make sure it's clean. Uh, we... We do not want to put any undue burden on those who receive our donations. And, of course, new new clothing. If you want to buy something or if you have something that was given to you for Christmas that doesn't fit or is not quite your style, um, please, uh, we would love to accept those as well. Um, more information can be given to you if you contact either me or Pastor Eric via phone or email. Uh, next, we have our Young Adults Fellowship is restarting. It's going to be starting on the 17th to uh, the 12th of May, so it's going to be going for a good uh, quarter. Um, now, a little bit of information on it. It's going to be on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m., and it's going to be going through the book of How to Give Your Faith Away uh, by Paul Little. It is a book on evangelism and how to evangelize. So if you're interested in that, please let Pastor Eric know. You can contact him. And if you're just in, interested in general in helping out with the young adult group, go ahead and give him a call as well. Next announcement is that uh, there's a new Bible study group starting up. This one's put on by Wai Ming and Harvey. It's going to be a once-a-month Bible study for now. It's going to be on the fourth Saturday of every month, and everybody's invited. Uh, the Bible study will go for about one hour each session, and it will be video lesson-based. Uh, so um, it, it seems pretty interesting. They'll be going through various books, such as John Mark. Uh, they have them up there. Uh, not the Philippines. <laughs> Philippians. <laughs> um, and Jonah. And if you're interested in uh, signing up for this, uh, for now, there's no termination date. It's only just uh, one session a month. And so it's uh, it's perpetual at this point. And if you're interested in signing up, please email Wai Ming. Um, like I said, everybody is welcome, and it sounds like it should be a good class to, to join. Next, we want to uh, talk about the yearly Bible reading. This is something that the English congregation has been doing for uh, a while now, since January. And it's a Bible reading, one, uh, reading through the Bible once in three years, so it's one chapter a day. Uh, I just kind of downloaded the app, the Version Bible app, just to kind of check out how to do this, and it, it takes a little bit of intuitiveness to, to kind of uh, find the, the reading plan, but the way you do it is you open up the app, and you uh, go to My Plans down at the bottom, and you, you can, there's like a little search bubble. Um, you can click that, and then you, you search for Bible in three years, and then um, basically Right now we're in year one, quarter one. So they have it listed out in year one, quarter two, year two, quarter four. So for example, so right now we're in year one, quarter one, and you'll start out in Genesis and do one chapter a day. Super easy. It, it shouldn't take you more than five minutes. Um, but it's a good way to make sure that we're reading our Bible actively. So let's do it together. Uh, and go ahead also to, if you just want to do online, you can do the same thing at Bible.com. Next, for our youth group, of which I am the pastor of, uh, today at 3 p.m., we have a seminar for parents. It's an encouragement seminar for—well, it says for our youth parents, but it's really for any parents. Uh, and it's going to be dealing with children who doubt. I think that it's one of the things that we need to deal with. In my research, 
I found that uh, your kid will doubt. And one of the interesting things I found is that um, millennials and Gen Z uh, are twice as likely to doubt their faith as um, Gen Xers and baby boomers. Also, too, kids who are highly educated and go to college are also 38% more likely to doubt their faith than those who don't. And so what that means is for kids in our community who are Gen Z and most of them will go to university, there's a real chance that they will be confronted with a serious doubt in their faith at some point in the future if they haven't already. So how do you deal with that as parents? Uh, Well, it, it is a normal thing to go through, but it helps for us to feel like we can have power or at least have some control over helping our children through these difficult seasons. And so uh, it's my pleasure to, to have this seminar. It's uh, I anticipate the whole thing uh, being about an hour and a half or so. Um, go ahead and sign up for the Zoom meeting. Um, just show up and the password's on the screen there. Uh, like I said, any of our parents are invited, but it's most specifically directed to the youth parents. Also, too, for Sunday school, uh, we do have a need for Sunday school teachers. We're getting some volunteers trickling in, and I'm very happy to, to say that we got um, one a day or two ago. And uh, so, I, you know, there's still a need. Please contact me. I would love to get in touch with you to uh, help to see what classes we need um, to be filled. Right now there's an Intro to Bible class. There's curriculum for that. Uh, another one is um, a uh, baptism class. Uh, which could use some help. And then uh, finally, we're looking at um, doing a class on overcoming sin and temptation. It's a, it's a book ris- written by a guy named Chris Lundgrad, and so um, it should be really good. I'm really looking forward to having this next quarter. It's a 13-week commitment, and so make sure that once you sign up, you know it's for 13 weeks, and then after that, you're free. Uh, so let me know. We'd love to have you help out with our Sunday school uh, next announcement is that our outdoor service is temporarily postponed for February. It's a little bit risky to be meeting in person these days, so we're just for the sake of safety, we're going to be postponing our outdoor service. News of the restarting will come to you as it's made available. Next, this is our uh, Sunday service sermon schedule. Uh, take note of the guest speakers on the 21st of February is Tim Wu, combined service on the 7th of March, and then another guest speaker on March uh, 14th, Simon Sito. This does not affect the youth group except for the combined services. Uh, So for those of you who only go to church on the days that we have guest speakers, (laughs) take note. Uh, And finally, we have some prayer requests. We want to pray for the safety and community of our, uh, safety and and recovery of our community, especially during the COVID vaccination distribution. I've been talking with a couple members who have been on the list to get it. Man, it's, it's a tough thing to be able to get on that list. You have to sign up, and then once the website opens up, it closes in, it, within an hour, and no way that you can get uh, signed up. So we want to pray for the distribution to go well. Pray for the f- job and financial security of everybody, of course. Seems that the market economy is kind of on the up, so it's good news. I want to pray for Roger's mother, who's in her second round of chemo. Uh, pray that she's able to do well. We just got some word that her white blood count is... W- after chemo, it's like right borderline of what is acceptable. So we want to pray that she continues to have the strength to go through this chemo and that she recovers. Um, and pray for Roger, too, as he's in Taiwan uh, indefinitely at this point until his mother recovers. I want to pray for Jay, uh, who's uh, weeks past a uh, heart surgery. So um, he seems to be doing okay. And we just want to pray for continued healing. It's a long recovery process, and so we want to pray for his healing and that soon he'll be up and able to get back to life and helping with his family. And finally, I want to pray for Tiffany, uh, who uh, is at this point... Um, Pastor Eric, is her is her recovery full and done at this point? After, no, she's still recovering. Okay. So uh, it takes a hit. It's a pretty serious illness, so... I want to pray that she continues to recover, and uh, she's going to be taking a second dose of the vaccine uh, here, and so we just pray that she's able to get that and that it positively increases her immunity. So that's all of our prayer requests and announcements for today. Let's go ahead and stand up for doxology, and then we can finish with our closing prayer.
Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we can be convicted to obey despite the arguments of our flesh that we can obey. Father, give us strength to love you. Help us to have good rest. And for those of us who are going to be partaking in the encouragement seminar for our parents tonight, or this afternoon, I guess, we just pray that it would be a time of of great communication and, and deep understanding as we are encouraged and understand the struggles of our children. So, Father, we pray for this. Father, help us to love you and to love our, our, our obedience to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you so much for coming today. And until we see you again next time, God in his peace be with you.